Almighty that you were able to make it to today. And we thank God for bringing you here safely. We are grateful to God Almighty. Amen. So if you can please stand up so I can uh, thank his holy name for his goodness, for his mercy, for his kindness. Amen. He has kept each one of you from January 1st, beginning of the year, to today, November 4th. A lot of things has happened, but God kept you and I. Let us worship and glorify his holy name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We worship you, Lord. We magnify your holy name. We thank you for the gift of life. Father, we thank you for keeping each one of us, Lord. It is by your grace and your mercy that we are here today. Father, we thank you that you fought our battles. Father, I thank you that you shielded each one of us, Lord, from every arrow of the enemy. We are standing here because of your grace, because of your love, because of your mercy. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Glory be unto your holy name, Jesus. There is no one like you, Lord. There is no one who deserves all praise, all glory, all adoration but you, Lord. Hallelujah. All honor, all glory, all praises unto you, Lord. The owner of our lives. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We welcome you in our midst, Lord Jesus. You said that when two or three gather together in your name, you are among them, Father. We are more than two. We are more than three. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come and have your way. In the name of Jesus. Marakashika borakasakariyande. Come and have your way, Holy Spirit. Come and have your way, Holy Spirit. Come change our lives. Come transform us in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. The book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 19. The Bible says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you, not, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Hallelujah. This is the women's conference that has been titled. The theme of the conference is the rejuvenated woman, rejuvenated man. It's not just women, it's men as well. Hallelujah. What does that mean? God is inviting you and I to the restoration of youth, vigor, and power, and appearance. God is calling you and I to the newness of life. God is calling you and I to be refreshed, to be renewed, to be renovated, to be restored. Hallelujah. And he says, behold, I will do it. That is promised to you and I. He said he will make a road in the wilderness. <laughs> you know, it's not possible to have a road. You know how the wilderness are. He said we make rivers in the desert. You know, there's no one in the desert. God say, I will make it possible. And if you look at the verse before, verse 18, it says, forget about the past. Hallelujah. He said, do not remember the former things. He said, forget the past. When God is going to do a new thing in us, he's going to renew it. He wants us to forget the past way of living, the past way of doing things. Hallelujah. So you're going to open our mouth tonight and thank his holy name. He promised to renew us, to rejuvenate us, 
to make things new. Let us pray, Master. Thank His holy name. Father, we thank you for your promise tonight, Lord. This evening, Lord, this weekend, to rejuvenate every one of us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that you're going to renew us, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that you're restoring us in the mighty name of Jesus. You're restoring our lives, Lord. You're restoring our destiny, Lord Jesus. You bring it back to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you in advance, Lord, for what you're going to do in this place in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for renewing us, Lord. Thank you for renewing our mind in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for renewing our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for rejuvenating us, Lord, to be more like you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you permission, Lord, to do all you want to do in the mighty name of Jesus. You said that we should be whole because you're doing a new thing, Lord. Come and have your way in the mighty name of Jesus. Come and do new things in our midst in the mighty name of Jesus. We give you, Father, permission to change us, Lord, to transform us, Lord, to be more like you. We give you all the glory, Father. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise, Lord, for what you're about to do in our midst. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In that same spirit, let's just lift them high this afternoon. Just begin to glorify his name. Just begin to call him sweet names in this place. Lord, we thank you. We thank you because there is none like you. We thank you because you are God. We thank you because you deemed us worthy to restore us. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus.
of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's our rejuvenate conference. We've got to act like we've been rejuvenated. Be rejuvenated people. So I'm going to get y'all up on your seats are rejuvenated at all because uh, we got to get to know each other a little bit. All right. You know, it's we're in the house of God. We got to learn to know who we are, what we like, what we don't like. So ah, uh, Jesus help me. This is my left, hallelujah. This is my right. Okay, so you got the left and we got the right. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions and you're going to move accordingly. Now, my first question is, I was told the speakers can sit this one out. I'll have mercy on you guys. All right, so I see a little bit more people over here moving quickly. So my first question to y'all is, if you like yellow, sit over there. If you like brown, Go over there. If you don't like any, stand right here. It's going to be real quick. If you don't like either brown or yellow, stand right here. All right? Come on now. Now, if you like fried chicken, go over there. If you like fried fish, go over there. If you don't like any, stand right here. But you don't make a choice. If you don't make a choice, basically, stand right here. If you can't choose, you're in the middle. If you just can't choose, you're in the middle. <laughs> Are we all good? Okay, if you like to fly, plane, if you like to take the plane, rather than drive, go over there. If you like to drive, stay here. If you can't choose, you're in the middle. Now look around at y'all and see, you see y'all have some things in common, right? Y'all see that? I like chicken, I like fish, I like brown, I like yellow, right? Now if you got a relative that you don't like, go over there. If you got a relative that don't like you, go over there. If you can't choose, you're in the middle. <laughs> if you just can't choose, you're in the middle. Now, it's all right, it's all right, it's okay. So here's, here's what I'm gonna say. It's good that you, you know, you make your choice. Look around and see the people you have stuff in common with. 
you know, we do have stuff in common. We're, we might be from different countries and we might speak different languages, but at the end of the day, we all got something in common. Thank you guys, good for that. Now, congratulations to all of you who made a choice. Now for y'all who didn't make a choice, I got an activity y'all gotta do. Now, I want y'all to come up here in the front. Hallelujah, don't be shy, it's not bad, it's easy. Just line up across and hold hands together. Mm-hmm. Yep, turn to the audience. And I'm going to start with you to the audience. Here you go. I want you to read this. Pass it down. And once everyone has read it, y'all do what it says. Mm-hmm. So read it to yourself. Pass it down. They should not know what you're about to do. <laughs> you're about to get rescued. Pass it along. <laughs> That's what you get. Mm -hmm. Now hold hands. Now on the count of three, I'm going to count you off, and then you're just going to shout as loud as you can. One, two, three, go. That's it. <laughs> now take your seats. <laughs> you can regain your positions if you want to go back to where you were sitting. But I uh, just got to get you up, get you moving a little, bit, a little bit. That's our slogan after church every Sunday when we finish our service. We tell everybody, come on, shout people. Meet me at the top because we are going up. When you've been rescued, you keep going up. Amen. Amen. So we are going to move along tonight in the name of Jesus. I just want our women to just give yourselves a little hand clap. Just shout rejuvenate. That was weak. Do it again. Rejuvenate. Come on. One more time. Rejuvenate. All right. That's who we are. Amen. So we are about to start. And right now, everyone will be in this room. And we're going to have, I'm going to introduce our speakers. I'm going to do them all at once for the sake of time. And we'll tell you who we will be having tonight. Amen. We do have some special people in our midst. We thank God for them. We thank God for what he's done in their lives. And they're going to share with us based on what God has done for them. So our very first speaker tonight is Sister Susie, our very own. My God, my God, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. This is in our house. All right, all right. So we've got Sister Susie is a medical doctor specialized in the field of psychiatry. Her ministerial title, one of the worship leaders here at RCCG, Fountain of Restoration Parish in Buffalo. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And she will be speaking on our mental health. Everybody says mental health matters. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So our next speaker is our wonderful guest speaker. She's here with us for the first time. Her name is Elder Lattimore. And let's give it up. Come on, RCCJ, give it up. Hallelujah. All right, all right. She is the founder of Thy Kingdom Era Church and a member of Tabernacle of Praise Church. And we just want to say thank you for coming to be with us tonight. We are looking forward to what God's about to do. Amen. And I like to call them the dynamic duo. This couple right here. Okay, Pastor and Mrs. Akimbola, they are provisional pastors in RCCG and lead pastors of Chapel of Praise Parish in Far Rockaway, New York. I know that's right, Far Rockaway, New York. So with that, on that note, I am going to hand this over and I'm going to call our very first speaker, our mental health specialist, Dr. Sister Susie, to come and speak to us tonight. Let's lift our, our let's put our hands together for Sister Susie. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen 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 you may have your seat amen i just want to thank god for the privilege to stand here to share um it's always a privilege to be on the pulpit um and i don't take it for granted in any way either to sing or to share something um i also count it a privilege what i do um as my job day-to-day -day job um First of all, I just want to pray a little bit, and then I'll dive right into it. Father, I thank you so much. You are a good father. You have set something for your people today, and I know that you will deliver. I'm just a vessel, humble standing here to share your word, to inspire your people, to bring them up higher. Father, I'm so grateful. Father, prepare our hearts, mine too, to receive from you. 
Father, I thank you so much for all that you are going to do and all that you are doing already. To you be all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration. Amen. So I was thinking about what, mental health is a broad topic, huge, huge topic. And um, I was thinking what, what aspect of it do I kind of go into? Um, and the Lord laid into my heart to really focus on our thinking. Really trying to find some of the roots. It's not the, it's not the main root of everything, but it is a root that a lot of things spring from. And so I said exploring the issue of mental health as, as a Christian, but you know, the highlight is healthy thinking, healthy life. And that's kind of where God you know, poked me at to you know, hear from him for. Um, background wise, like mentioned, I'm a medical doctor. Um, I uh, specialize in adult and child psychiatry, so I'm board certified in both areas. Um, so I have about 10 years worth of experience so far, um, and I'm grateful to God for that. And when I was picking the field of psychiatry after medical school, it was quite a decision to make. Uh, but luckily, you know, I'm a Christian first, and so the decision is always in, has to be inspired by, you know, what is God telling you to do? And people was like, oh, you know, Sister Susie, I think, you know, you should be a pediatrician, you should, because you have this, you know, feel of being a mom. And that was not, you know, what was, I mean, of course, I'm still in the area, but, um, you know, God led me to this area. And I had some confusion about it, because I, un, unknown to me, I did have some feelings about the issue of mental illness and mental health and all that but he led me to it and I and I had some people even in the in our um, environment or the Christian environment that you know even prayed for me to say that that was not something that I was called to do but that's why it's important that you have to know God for yourself and what God is telling you and what God's calling you to do so this was the direction and so I you know I was confident in it because God spoke directly to me um, so, the issue or the area of healthy thinking, healthy life, and that topic itself kind of leads to the end. So when you think, when your, your mind is healthy, when your thought process is healthy, it does eventually help you live a healthy life. Um, so where do we kind of start from this? Um, like I said, mental health is a broad big, big topic, and it affects every one of us. We cannot escape it. Um, if you're honest with yourself, you know, we can do a lot to build our physical help, health, our appearances, uh, but a root is the way our mind works. And, and we have to be very aware, and we have to accept it, um, that what eventually comes out of us, what we do and how we interact with the world around us starts from in here. And there's so many things in the scripture that talks about our mind and things like that. But you can move on to the next slide. And this popular um, scripture, the first one, and I will read just the, the A portion of it. And later, probably I'll have the media um, um, project an extended version of it. So this is the book of Proverbs 23 from verse 7. And we're just looking at the A portion of it. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So there is no two way about it that if you're thinking sadness, if you're thinking fear, there is no way you can think sadness and give happy. It just, just, just doesn't work that way. There is no way if you're thinking, I can't make it. I'm not good enough. I'm not book smart. There is no way you can actually you know, succeed in that way. It really starts from inside. And the sooner we honestly accept that, not just caring about, let's just, you know, you know, we're okay. But really be very cautious that there is so much power in how we think about ourselves. You can do 
a lot of things you can make up, you can dress pretty, but if the mind is focused and immersed with a pattern, that is just the way you will bring yourself out. If you feel like you are unworthy, you will bring yourself that way to people. You will be very apologetic for things. You will feel like you don't deserve and you will settle just because you truly believe that's who you are. And even when somebody else is telling you, you are beautiful, you are worthy, it doesn't really hit, you know, compared to the words you have said to yourself over and over again. I'm always amazed by the scripture where, I can't remember where it is, but it said, David encouraged himself in the Lord. That always used to get to me. You know, you can have a lot of people encourage you, like, Stakanessa, it's going to be okay. But if you haven't told yourself, it's going to be okay. It's going to be a long journey for you. You can have the entire nation cheering you up and say, you are amazing, you know, and that you'll be all right. But if it hasn't settled within you, it will not be all right for you because you will follow in accordance to the way you have set in your mind. So it is very, very powerful. It is very, very powerful. One of my favorite scriptures is the book of Philippians 4, 8. I think it's on the, still on the same slide. And I remember getting a bracelet about this scripture because I wanted to I wanted to change my life and when I started getting aware of how powerful my thought was you know this scripture was very very instructional for me and I hope it becomes that for you if you haven't you know dwelt on this scripture the book of Philippians 4 verse 8 and it says what whatsoever is noble Whatever is right, what is pure, what is lovely, the things that people admire, that people would clap their hands for and say, yes, you know, whatever is excellent, you know, the excellent things, whatever people would praise, you want to set your mind on those things. You want to set your mind on those things because you become that. You become noble, you become the right person, you become the pure person, you become the person that is admired, you become the person that's excellent, you become the person that's praiseworthy. When they, when they mention your name, they don't say, uh-oh, they're like, yes, that person, you know. So the Bible is saying that we should set our mind on those kind of things. And that's a very powerful thing because it makes you those things. And those are the good things. And those are the good things. So why, why really should we create an awareness around this? If there is something good, there's always something that there's the opposite of it as well. So unhealthy, unhealthy thoughts, unhealthy thinking. So what is, why should I even bother about getting my mind to a place of pure things, of things that are lovely, of things that are beautiful, excellent, of things that are praiseworthy? Why do I have to get my mind there? Because the opposite has major consequences, big consequences, not just... You know, it's horizontal and vertical. So when I say horizontal and vertical, it has consequences with your relationship with God and consequences with your relationship, you know, with the people around you, your family. And sometimes it carries all the way down generations. So a big deal, big deal. So you really, you cannot, absolutely not be successful you fulfill God's purpose for your life if your mind is on the unlovely things, 
on the things that are not pure, the things that are not excellent. If you are a person, when they call your name, they're like, oh, oh, you know, I don't want that person because, you know, what, you, what your mind is, is your, really your identity. It comes through. There's no way about it. You cannot, as a child of God, you cannot fulfill what God has destined for you if your mind is immersed in, on the, in unhealthy thoughts. It's a big time roadblock. And I just put debt there. And, and this is, can be multiple folds, but let's make it twofold. It can lead to physical debt, actually. People have died because they have stayed in a thought that is very dark. They've stayed there. They've gathered people around them to really encourage that thought. And, and then they decided, sure, you know, I'll do it. I'll call it quits. So it has major consequences, big time. And it can also cut off your relationship with God, too. So death multiple folds, actually. Big consequence, big consequence. In the Bible, there are a number of examples of people who actually follow through to end their life. So it's there in the Bible. You know, I mean, this is just like seven scriptures about people who eventually said, I can't take it no more because their mind is kind of filled with those dark thoughts. So just something to think about, consequence. Why do we have to you know, get our minds thinking right? There is a good news about you know, the way we think. Um, we'll move to the next one. There is a, I mean, there is a, a path that it can lead us to. When we think about a thing, and this is just you know, basic cognitive behavioral you know, approaches, um, when you think about a thing, it makes you feel some kind of way. So it affects you physiologically. And then you act in that way. You act in that way. You feel sadness. You think sadness. You feel sadness. You act in sad ways. You withdraw yourself. You don't do the things that are exciting. So you, do, you get yourself in a negative state, as we'll call it. And it's a cycle that keeps going and keeps going. So we got to break it somewhere. And we're just focused on the thinking part of it, which is one of the places you can break the cycle. So we may skip the next one. It was just a scripture about um, Elijah. After doing something, you know, great, he had killed the prophets of Baal and got a threat and he was afraid. And it led him to do certain things. He had to run away because he was afraid and all that. So it does have consequences. It affects how we behave and how we move forward in life. Because of time, I will move on so we can get to some solution base. Um, so where does unhealthy thinking come from? And this is a big question. We cannot really conquer everything right here, right now. Where does it come from? How do we get to this place where we start thinking in ways that will ruin our lives. How do we, how do we even get there? So I, we can talk about just some, but you know, there are you know, various factors. When we think about a person who has you know, a mental difficulty, I mean, illness is a big one. You know, we, can, we all have gone through various mental distress. But where does, where does this unhealthy negative thinking come from? What we really surround ourselves with, if we're really honest, our diet, when I say diet, what we really voluntarily place, our, where we place ourselves, it does, no one is capable of, everyone is capable of being influenced. You're not that, you know, and a godlike in a way that you cannot absorb things, even if you're the Pope. Being a place so long, you will become that place receive a certain type of message, you will take it in as long as you're there. 
So it does influence. So if you're around people who are very, very negative, who talk about sadness a lot, who talk about things not working out, who talk, talks about, you know, how will it work out for, you know, being single and, you know, whatever, as I said, in age or whatever that might be, it does get into you. There's no two way about it. So there is, that is, that is, it is a cause, but you have to know that it also informs us that we can shift, but you have to be aware and you have to be honest that you are capable of being influenced. No matter how powerful or filled you are, there's no two way about it. That's just the way we are built. We absorb things. So your environment makes a, a difference in what you really, what goes on up here. So you have to be very careful what you're surrounding yourself with. Another very big thing is, I don't know how many of us are parents in here. Your parents, okay. So really, we become the environment for our kids. And your parents were also your environment too. So. It's one way to break the cycle. That's why being aware of a pattern, you know, it could be, you, you might be sharing, you might be displaying things, you know, and sharing your thoughts unbeknownst to you, but it's unhealthy. You share, you know, you, you display inadequacies all the time. You talk about how it would not work out and how we don't have enough and how, you know, terribly anxious you are and how angry you are all the time. And, of course, those things spill out. We can't control it all. But you have to be aware that you are also building a generation. You are creating an environment that will become you know, the thought pattern for your children. So, but it also gives us hope that we can break that. And that's why it's very, very important for parents to take care of themselves and make some changes. You know, because you have... Your first evangelism is in your home, right there. The kids, they, very early they know. They receive it. So you have to be very careful what you're displaying. And if you have some things and you're, you're conscious that there's an issue with the way you display yourself and how you think and how you spill yourself over to your kids, you have to work on it. You can't let it carry on to the next generation. So that's one aspect that you have to be very, very conscious of it. Um, so your, your parents gave you some things and you are giving your kids some things too. So those, those, you are an environment and your parents were an environment for you. So be, be aware of that. So this is a call to awareness, honestly, you know, you know and that we, we should be very cautious that there is power in thinking. It's not just a flimsy thing. It goes a long way to change our life and sometimes it can cause, you know, great things for us, but it can also cause destructive things for us. One, one interesting phenomenon that not everyone is used to doing this, it's called, and this might be a big term, not, maybe not for everyone, it's called metacognition, where you actually take the time to think about your thinking. You, you tell yourself, hey, Susie, what am I really thinking about? You know, and you really identify it. Like, I'm, you're, it's like you're thinking about your thinking. It's a very active process, but it's powerful. Because your thinking is not just one thing that just stays there and becomes it. You can shift it. And that's a good thing. You can shift it. So creating that awareness as a man, as a woman, having those quiet moments of meditation where you actually think about what you thought about yesterday. And do the ABCs of your thinking. When I say the ABCs, like what caused me to think this way? And what did I do in response to my thinking? And see if it's a positive outcome, it turned, became a positive outcome or a negative outcome. And correct it. And when you think about what led to it, you know, you think about the environment that led to it, shift it. So, but you have to be aware that your thinking is powerful and take the time to think about your thinking then we can shift. But if you just carry on very casually with life and you're just like, oh, it just happened, you know, I'm hot-tempered, whatever that is. I say my mind. 
what happened after you did that? What, what, was the, what was the effect? Was the effect good? Did it cause a positive outcome? Like, sit down and, think and adjust. The good thing about the way God made us is that we can change. You can change. You're not fixed like that. And that's the way God made us. Even God doesn't mess with our ability to like choose. He said, I've given you life and death, but choose life. But that's still up to you to do that. So there's flexibility in how we can. Our lives can be molded. And that's a good thing. So taking the time to think about your thinking is a very aware and it's a tool we have to kind of like take on upon ourselves to make some changes. So I will kind of wrap up with this. And um, like I said, mental health is a huge topic, and I just wanted to focus on the thinking part, which is a root. It's not the main root, but it is a big root. So your thought, your thought identity is your behavior identity. And the good thing is that it's not fixed. It can change. If we go back to that... Um, Initial scripture where it said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you look at um, verse 6 all the way to 8, it's a huge story there where I think uh, a miser, a miser is someone who is very who, stingy person. They said, if he gives you food, you know, I say, come and eat. But you know this guy is a miser. He doesn't, he's very tight-fisted. Don't just start eating up like that, you know. That's a problem because the way you know he thinks that way, he's very stingy. You will, you will, the Bible says you will vomit it out because the way a man thinks, even if he says pretty things, but this is who he is. That's, that's he, who he is. So, but for us right now, the good news is that we can change. We can change, and, and God designed us that way. He gave us the power to join in with him to liberate ourselves. And all praise to him for doing that. Your thought identity is your behavior identity, and it's not fixed. We can change. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Oh, come on. We could do better than that. This was good stuff. All right, come on. Dr. Susie, thank you so very much. My God, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our next speaker, we will bring up our visitor for today, Elder Lattimore. Come on up, sister. Come on, guys. Give her a hand. Give her a hand in Jesus' name. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everybody. 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 He's worthy of praise and honor. Give him glory, everybody. Somebody lift up your voice and give him glory. Somebody tell him how great he is. Somebody tell him how wonderful he is. Somebody tell him how much you're in love with him. Somebody express how much you adore him. Somebody give him glory in this place. You're worthy of glory and honor and praise. And we honor you in this place, Father. So humbled, so privileged to be your children. So humbled, so privileged to speak to you. So humbled, so privileged to learn about you. So humbled, so privileged to come together with our siblings. So humbled, so privileged to be your servants. We're so humbled and so privileged to carry your love, God. We are humbled and privileged to hear what you want to say, God. We are humbled. We are both humbled and privileged. Knowing that you're great and big and high and mighty and purpose full in all-knowing and omnipotent and omniscient and ever-evolving and incomparable you're incomparable you're in you are incom you're incomparable that's what you are to us we know that there is none that can compare to you you're incomparable and when you see when you speak we listen and so thank you God Thank you for the privilege to hear from you.
thank you for the brilliance you've placed in your daughter. Thank you for anointing her for such a time as this. Thank you for your wind in this building. Thank you for your power in this room. Thank you for the anointing that you feel when you open that door. Thank you for permeating your spirit in this place, God. We say thank you. And we don't take you for granted. And we are not desensitized to your presence. And we do not take you lightly. And we celebrate you. Because you are so worthy to be celebrated. You are a God who wants your children to be rejuvenated. You are a God who wants your children to have sound minds. You are a God who wants your children to be whole. You are a beautiful, perfect, loving God who wants your children to be obedient. You are a God who wants your children to be blessed in abundance. You are a God who wants your children to live and live again. And so we honor you in this place. And I pray that you feel our love, Father. I pray that you feel how much we love you. And we're only here because we know who you are. And we're only here because we want to know you more. And we're only here because we want to hear from you. And we're only here because we want to chase after you. And we're only here because we don't want to be hiccuped and chicked and tripped up by every rock that life throws at us. We want to know what you've given us. We want to know the power you've instilled so that we can truly live in your wholeness. You're mighty. And we love you so much. We love you so much. Thank you for this space. Thank you for your wind. Thank you for your Y'all gotta excuse me because he's real to me. And when his presence is present, it stills me. It's not too much I need to say when he's speaking. Giving honor to the leadership of this house. Thank you so, so much for having me, you and First Lady. Thank you so, so much for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we can clap for that. Thank you. Ooh, to every pastor, elder, every sense of leadership in the building, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you. I honor you, I honor you in your places. Uh, to all my family, friends, kingdom cousins, all you beautiful sisters of mine, I don't know y'all in y'all pink shirts. Y'all ain't bring me one. I got an attitude about that, but we'll talk about that later. All right, all right. I'm happy to be here. Where's my sister that was preaching? Goodness gracious. I love how the Lord will web words together and everything he spoke to you. Well, you'll see in a minute, but he knows how to web words together and he's speaking to us tonight. I'm going to get right to the word so we can get in and out as quick as I'm going to be sat down in nine minutes. All right. Y'all put up a clock. Now I got nine minutes. All right. 
<laughs> Father, I have no wisdom. I have no wit. I have no anointing. I have nothing without you. You speak. Sit me down. I have nothing to say without your voice through my tongue. Speak to your children that they will know that you are Elroy, that you've seen them, that you heard them, that you are present with them through all they've gone through, God, that they will know that you are present in all things that you heard when they were crying. You heard when they were speaking. You saw when they felt like they were fragmented and that now you want to speak to them to know that they can be put back together again. My sister said we can make a choice to be different, that we will make a choice to be put back together again in your wholeness. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you guys today from the topic, one touch away from wholeness. Somebody say, I'm one touch away. I'm just one touch away from wholeness. Somebody say, get close, get whole. If I get close, I'll get whole, right? All right, so can we just stand for the reading of the word very quickly? The book of Mark, the fifth chapter, the 25th verse through the 31st verse. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. But instead of getting better, she got worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched the, the, the hem, y'all know the word, of his garment. Because she thought, my sister was talking about thoughts, she thought, if I could just touch, if I, if I just... If I could just touch him, if I could just, if I could just touch, if I could touch the hem of his garment, then I will be whole. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that when she was freed from all of her suffering at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. He turned around to the crowd and he asked, who touched, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then when the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear in front of the whole crowd, she told the whole truth. He turned and said to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. You may be seated. Somebody say, get close, be whole. Get close and be whole. All right. I'm going, I promise y'all I'm going to run through this because this is about an hour's worth of preaching. All right. So, so let's talk about what it means to bleed. First things first, to bleed is to have your body leaking blood from either one or two things, either injury or sickness. Right. And so we have this woman who we don't know her name. Now, she was written about in both Mark and Luke, right? Went back to Matthew to see what he had to say about her. He didn't have too much to say about her. So, so, so Luke, speaking from a physician's standpoint, gives a little bit of a different story. However, I love the way Mark breaks it down because he goes into the details and he's very meticulous about what happened when this woman was, getting, was making her way to get to Jesus. And so the, one of the first things we realize about this woman is that she was never truly given a name. Her name was the woman with the issue, right? The woman with the issue. Anybody know what it feels like to be identified by your issue? Yeah, it might not be the issue of blood. See, because for women, that's a regular issue for us. We all have women. You know, we all have that issue of blood. However, it becomes more of an issue when your issue sticks around too long. When the issue sticks around too long, what happens is you end up with two issues. Your first issue is you got an issue. Your second problem is you got a problem with the fact that your issue won't go away, <laughs> right? You end up with two issues. Man, anybody, anybody know what it feel like to be identified by your issue? Oh, yeah, I know them. That's the one that was divorced. Oh, yeah, I know them. That's the one. She don't take care of her kids. Oh, yeah, I know them. You know, she's not mentally stable. Yeah, I know. You know, everything but a child of God, right? You get called everything, anything, everything, anything but a child of God. And, and somehow people take that identity and, 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 and they put that in you. And sometimes when the issue has been around for so long, you start to believe their narrative. And, and after a while, it's not them putting the negative name on you. It's you putting the name on yourself. 
So instead of you walking in the wholeness that God has assigned to you, you're walking in. I made that mistake when I was 16. I can't take it back. When I go to the church, they tell me I got to repent about it. When I repent about it, I think it'll be over. But for some reason, I'm still dealing with it. Now I'm 36, still dealing with the issue of what happened when I was 16. And I want to be whole, but I'm fragmented and, or should I say, bleeding. I'm bleeding. I, I'm, I'm bleeding. Now you can't see my bleeding because it's internal. But I'm bleeding. So no, I don't have an attitude. I'm, I'm bleeding. No, 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 no. I'm not bitter. I'm not, I promise I'm not bitter. I'm made in God's image and I have, be- I have a beautiful family and people I love. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not bitter. I'm just I'm bleeding. No, I'm not angry. I'm not screaming at you. What happened is I'm bleeding on the outside. I'm, I'm bleeding. And their name for you becomes your name for you. And before you know it, you're not living by the name that God gave you when he birthed you before he knew you. You're living by the name that people have assigned to you. And you can't get too far while you're fragmented. And so we have this woman and the Bible says that she for many, many years was seeking help. And so she's going to this physician and that physician. Mark says she was going to the physicians and instead of her getting better, she ended up getting worse. Anybody ever went to find a solution for a pain in your life and instead of it making it better, it made it worse? I need to come knock on some doors. You know you shouldn't have been on Amazon spending $3,000. Get off the computer. Put the phone down. It felt good in the moment, right? It ain't help your credit. Ain't help your credit. Or that phone call you pick up in the middle of the night, you know you shouldn't have had your phone on anyway. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Right? And those things that we seek or that plate you make or that ice cream you have, telling on myself, that ice cream you have, right, that is that you're eating to consume the pain that you're in in the moment. But afterwards, you're like, what did I do? What did I do? Right? Because you're looking for something to fix the pain and the bleeding that's within you. But for some reason, all it does is make it worse. Don't the enemy know how to give you all kinds of vices and vehicles to get to things that will make you worse all while you're seeking to be made better? So we got to be careful about what we grab hold to when we're bleeding. When we're bleeding. When we're bleeding. Really, really quickly, there are a couple things this woman did to seek her wholeness that When I meet her in heaven, I'm telling y'all right now, we're going to have a real long talk because I want to let her know you the man, the one man. Because the way that you went about this is on a level of courage that I wish I had on this earth. Let me tell y'all what she did. The first thing she did was she heard. The word said she heard there was a man that was healing people, right? And if we want to give a little bit of context to the scripture, Jesus was on his way to Jairus' daughter to, 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 to help her because he told her, my daughter's about to die, right? And she was 12 years old. On the way there, he meets a woman that's bleeding for 12 years. Come on, y'all. God, da- ain't, no, ain't no coincidence there. There's no coincidence. 12 met 12, right? And so, he, Jesus on his way to heal somebody else run and bump into you the woman heard that he was healing people and she said I gotta get to him the first thing she did the first thing we need to do to be whole is to hear faith come by hearing hearing by the word of right so when we're listening to the radio and we're listening to social media and we're listening to gossip and, and we're on the phone and we're listening to all these things and then we're wondering why am I not still whole well what's happening is you're opening your ear gate and you're listening to everything that will keep making you fragmented broken disheveled instead of putting your ear to the one thing that is sure and solid to make you whole faith come by hearing hearing by the word of God now again this woman was super courageous y'all 
She was so courageous because back in those times to have an issue of blood and here's some again some more context to the scripture when I went to seminary and 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 uh, got my bachelor's in theology one of the things that that really messed my mind up was so it, the, the history of the Bible if you really really look into the history of the word and the things that we don't really look into on the surface it makes the word way more clear it makes it have a lot more substance okay so back in those times when you had a, a issue of blood it was not something you could keep a secret it was something the whole town knew because the law was you had to walk around saying I got an issue of blood I got an issue of blood I got an issue of blood I got an issue of you had to make people know what your issue was could you imagine having to walk around and tell the world what you're dealing with on the inside can you imagine having to walk around and try to be accepted while you're telling people how you're bleeding on the inside I don't know about you but I know the world that we live in will leave you by yourself and isolated because when people know the truth of what you're dealing with most people can't handle it because the hypocrisy inside of us says if you're broken I can't be around you because I want to be whole so the world knew the town knew that she was not whole they all knew about her issue but something about this courageous woman did not care she said I got to get to Jesus. The first thing she did was hear. The second thing she did was see. Quite often we talk about the fact that she was walking out. She was running after Jesus, trying to get to Jesus. However, we don't pay attention to the fact that if you don't see him, you don't know which way he coming. What are you saying, Elder Kamara? Are you seeing Jesus in your situation? Are you seeing him in that family loss? Are you seeing him in that rejection? Are you seeing him in that ostracism? Are you seeing him in your isolation? Are you seeing him in that divorce? Are you seeing him in the things that are hurting you and making you bleed? Are you seeing what he's doing? My Bible tells me that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And so while you are leaking, while you are bleeding, you have an opportunity that we don't have in our joy and in our big and our beautiful times where we're galloping through life and everything is great. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Therefore, if your heart is broke, God is close. What better place to be? What better place to be? The first thing she did was she heard. The second thing she did was she saw Jesus. The third thing she did was she thought. And as my sister said, sometimes I think when we hear this story, we all, y'all tell me if you like me. When you hear this story, do you envision her saying, if I could just touch the hem of his God? Is that... It, yes? No? Yes? Can somebody tell me? Is that what y'all... You envision her saying it, right? But the word doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Now, my whole life, I was studying it and I was hearing, just making stuff up, right? I guess we all the same as we learned about that chicken and fish, right? We all the same, right? We all the same, right? I, in my mind, I'm saying, she said, if I could just touch, right? And so my mind is saying, yeah, yeah, you know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. She just taking her steps. If I could just touch, if I could just touch, if I could just touch. And, and, the, and that word, her tongue, led her to the hem of Jesus' garment. But that's not what truly happened. She did not say, the, bar, the word doesn't say she said a word until she confessed what she did the word says she thought my sister said we can think our way out of where we are and then what she just preached well our thoughts matter our thoughts matter it was her thought initially that got her to the place where she touched the hem of Jesus garment and got whole it was her thought can you imagine the other thoughts that went through her mind Let's step into her shoes for about 2.3 seconds. Can we do that? Woman, issue, blood, man, I've been bleeding for 12 years. I've went to all these different physicians. Nobody has helped me. My mind would say, I'm not trying nothing else because I done tried everything. They done took all my money. I lost all my friends. I lost all my family. I lost this. I lost that. No, I gave everything I had. I don't have anything else to give. Negative thinking. 
It will leave you broken. But her mind said, and the courage within her said, and her denial of living in her issue and allowing it to identify her, that said, I'm going to keep thinking positive. And if I can just touch him, if I could just get to him, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just get close enough to him, if I could just touch the hem, if I could just touch, move. I know you're talking about me. I know you see me. I know I'm not supposed to be out here. I'm in the midst of this crowd. I know y'all saying everything you want to say. I know y'all like, how she get out here? How she get close to him? I don't care. If I could just touch him. Her mind led her to a better place. Her mind led her to wholeness. Her mind led her to freedom. So my question to you, my brothers and sisters are, if we are not rejuvenated and if we are still, why not? What has led us there? Our minds. My sister read Philippians 4 and 8. My mind, <laughs> when I was studying, said Philippians 4 and 6, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for, be worried. Let me break that down. Be worried about nothing. But in all things, through prayer and supplication, present your wants unto God and give thanks and the peace of God that surpasses all your understanding. It will sustain your heart and mind. It will sustain your heart. It will sustain your heart and mind. And, what, and then whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, let your mind go there because your thoughts will lead you. Whether it's backwards, sideways, or forward, your thoughts will lead you. Your thoughts will lead you. Your thoughts will lead you. And I'm almost done. The fourth thing she did, the fourth thing this beautiful, courageous woman did was touch Jesus. Now, y'all yeah, got to excuse me because the secret place with the Lord is my favorite place in the whole wide world. I can't wait to get to heaven and know that my whole entire life is just glorifying God. Because in that secret place, in the place where it's just him and I, it is the most special, supernatural, transformative gift we have on this earth. If you have not, find you a closet, make it your prayer space. If you have not, make, find you a room, make it your prayer area. If you have not, I don't care if it's a rug, roll it out and lay there for a couple hours. Watch your life change. Your life will change because your mind will change. And your mind will change because your thinking will change. You will be transformed by the renewing of your mind in that space. What this woman did is she touched Jesus. She pressed, pressed all the murmuring, all the complaining, all the this, all the that, even her own stuff. She said, I don't, I don't care about nothing. All I know is I trust the holiness in front of me and I know that it can heal me. And so I'm going to press past everybody and I'm going to touch the hem of him. And the Bible says immediately she was made whole. Immediately. Wait a minute. So you're telling me. That this woman touched the dirty, filthy portion of Jesus' clothing that was drugged through the streets of Jerusalem? You mean to tell me she touched the part that was wet and muddy? You mean to tell me she touched the least of him and it changed her? The absolute, the bottom of him and it, and it changed her? The part of him that most people wouldn't want their feet to touch? She touched it with her hand. She touched the filthiest part of him and instantly she was made whole? That makes me look inside, y'all. Because if we are not healed and if we are not whole, what are we touching? Who? Because he's available for us. The best of him is available for us. What are we touching? Now, typically, when we come together, we talk about having needing one touch from God. Right? I just need one touch from you. And it's incredible. But if we flip the narrative, what would happen if we touch him? The scripture says, Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? One disciple said, and I think it was Peter, because Peter had a whole lot of mouth, right? But he turned around, he said, what you mean everybody touching you? Everybody's touching you. What, 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 
body is touching you. Jesus said, no, no, no. Now, I felt, the, I felt the hands. But what I know is that somebody special touched me because power went out of me. You know what she did? She got Jesus' attention. It's crazy how you can be a, in a crowd of people and make your way through everything and everybody. And out of everybody, Jesus turns around and say, uh-oh, who touched me? I don't know about you, but I want to be the person that Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? Because somebody, some, some power just went out of me. Now, I don't know. I know these other people been coming to me for this and that, but there's something different about her. There's something. Di- she's really, really pushy. She's really pressing. She's really determined. She's really obedient. And what I know is that somehow power left out of me. I got to turn around because not only am I willing to touch her, but she's willing to touch me. Who in the word my siblings is get close and get whole. Because I think subconsciously we think touch anything. But the truth of the matter is you can't touch something you're not close to. My mother is sitting there with two babies. In order for me to touch her, I got to take infallible steps to get over there and reach. Y'all following me? And reach to touch her in order to feel. I can't touch her from over here. Let me make this a little more plain. I can't touch Jesus while I'm doing everything else. I can't touch Jesus while I'm distracted by everything else. I can't touch Jesus while I'm listening to everything else. I can't touch Jesus while I'm scrolling social media all day. I can't touch Jesus while my mind is in a negative place. I can't touch Jesus when when I'm bitter and angry and I'm and I'm living there. I can't touch Jesus when my mind is in what happened when I was seven and eight and I'm angry about it. I can't touch Jesus if I. I don't get close to him. What are you saying, Elder Lattimore? I'm saying, where's your word? Where's your fasting? Where's your praying? Where's your secret place? Where's everything that gets all the distractions and all the noise out of your ear? Because you got to separate yourself away from the things that are keeping you away from Jesus. If you want to get to the point where you do not just get near him, but you get close to him and you touch him. Because you know what happened, y'all, when we touch Jesus? Ah, there's not a way on this earth and I say it all the time there's no way on earth you can be in the presence of God and come out the same it's not possible it's not possible it's not possible it's not possible Paul was a murderer Saul was a murderer turned Paul why because he got close to Jesus Mary Magdalene went from one of those women that I don't even want to talk about because I don't even like what people talk about them because here's the truth. The truth of the matter is nobody is just any kind of way for no reason. Most of us are just bleeding. We're bleeding. She went from that to a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Why? Because she got close. In a world that offers you every distraction under the sun, to be so far away from the one that can heal you and make you whole. If the question is, I don't know why I'm so fragmented. I'm not sure why I'm so broken. I don't know why I feel like I'm trying to get to a place of wholeness and I can't get there. It's because we're too far. Father, draw us close. Somebody say, Father, draw me close. Father, draw me close. I encourage you, my brothers and my sisters today, let nothing keep you away from the Him that can heal and make your whole entire life whole. Get close to God and be made whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to stand on the side. Come on, y'all could do better than that. Give God praise. Give God praise. Give God praise. Hallelujah. There's a song as she was speaking. It just came in my heart. Um, choir, it's Draw Me Close to You. I think you've sung that song before. Y'all know, yes, that song. That one. That one. Come on. Close to you.
Hallelujah. 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 You heard the woman. It's about the touch. And it starts in the mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are about to break. But before we go, I just want us to just pray. We had two speakers. And I just want us to lift our voices and just bless them right now. Hallelujah. Just pray for them. Father, we cover them right now in the blood of Jesus. God, what has gone out of them, we have received it with gladness. So we pray that you will restore and you will rejuvenate them tonight. And we thank you for their service in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Come on, give Elder Lattimore a hand, another hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, that was a word. That was a word. I hope you have been taking notes. We are going to be holding our questions for the, for the end. There will be a Q&A session. At this time, you have about 15 minutes to get refreshments. Use the bathroom. The woman's bathroom is that way. The men's bathroom is that way. And after that, the men and the women will be separated. So men, you will be going upstairs. Um, and the woman, you will be remaining here. You've got 15 minutes. Amen. Glory to God. And our refreshments are right over there. Hallelujah. Just greet somebody while you're at it. <laughs>